Hey, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Cool. I'm going to start this out by asking a question. How many of you, this is your first time at a B-Sides event? Look at that. Look how many people are brand new to B-Sides. This is awesome. So let me be the first to welcome you and say you're going to have an awesome time. There's a ton of awesome talks lined up. If you see one of these staff members, thank them for all the hard work they're putting in because they're doing a kick-ass job here. So uh, this next question, I think I'm going to get the majority of the folks to raise their hand because it is a B-Sides conference. How many of you have a job in which you have some sort of touch into the security realm? So you do network admin, sysadmin. Keep your hands up for me. So all right, now how many of you have actually ever took what you knew about InfoSec and you thought about, what if I decided to do something malicious with that, with that knowledge? You've got, so I, yeah, so I've got, I would expect I've got, you know, my pen testers, you know, red teamers in the room thinking, you know, yeah, I do that on a daily basis, right? I, I hack companies. Okay, now, how many of you, the saw your hands raised, have actually gone through with crafting an intricate attack process on how you would go about targeting organizations, exploiting them, profitizing off of that, and then trying to maintain non-attribution through the entire process. So there's a couple. There's a couple in the room. There's a couple in the room. But this is, this is why I'm here. I, I thought it'd be fun exercise to kind of just walk through the process of a dedicated attacker. I'm a pen tester, and I compromise organizations every week. It's, it's easy. As my coworkers in the back can tell you, we do it weekly. Um, what I wanted to go for is if, if I, as a pen tester, or somebody in the security community were to just wake up evil one day, how would I go about doing that? So I'm going to show you how, me personally, how if I were to just wake up evil one day, how I'd go about doing this. So let's, let's have some fun with this. So some key focal points of this talk. The main, the main theme you're going to find through this entire talk is non-attribution. So, you know, I, on a daily basis, I'm doing exploitation of organizations. So I spent a lot of time just focusing on how, what, louder, louder, scream. Okay. Well, the mic doesn't have volume or. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so the uh, the thing is, is like I had to spend a lot of time thinking like, okay, you know, I. We usually have organizations that, you know, know where we're coming from IP-wise. You know, we're not doing real, legit, like, I'm trying to not get caught hacking, right? So I had to really put a lot of thought into this. The next thing is, how am I going to go about picking targets? Am I just going to pick them at random? Am I just going to, you know, say, hey, I don't like that guy over there. I'm going to go target him. Um, and then reconnaissance, right? So how can I just go take open source information, things I can find freely available on the Internet, and potentially find exploits for a company, you know? just freely available. Uh, and then the actual exploitation stage, right? So we have to compromise the company in some manner. Uh, and then eventually we'll talk about how I think I would go about profitizing off of it. So real quick, who am I? I'm a pen tester at Black Hills Information Security. Um, we've got some of my coworkers here. Uh, I'm also a host of a, a web show called Hack Naked TV. Um, where I talk about random news things and rant a little bit. And then I've, I'm also previously a, a defender. So a lot of this talk, I'm, I'm mainly kind of putting on my defensive hat because I really wanted to not get caught, right? Like, so all of my, my previous experience with, with defending a network and trying to catch an attacker, I tried to really put that into this talk. So quick side note, something I thought was kind of interesting that I want to share with you. So most of you probably signed up on the B-Sides website, right? You probably went there and you know, paid your money. Um, one thing I noticed that was kind of interesting about it is there's a picture on the website. So I'm in that picture. This is me two years ago sitting in Kevin Johnson's keynote. And so it, the thing that's kind of amazing is that at this point in my life, like I totally would have never expected to be right here today. Never. Like I, I mean, I was a security engineer. I never performed any pen tests, never you know, did any con talks or anything like that. Um, so for me to be up here today, it's like, what the hell? Um, but anyways, my, my point is, like, in the last two years since then, I've performed pen testing at 70 different companies. I've recorded 20 different Hack Naked TV episodes. I've, been, I've spoken at three different security conferences now, and I've written a blog post that, you know, kind of, kind of helped me get to where I am. And now I'm adding keynote to that list, and I really have everyone in the room to thank for that because it's, it's the security community that has helped me make myself who I am. Um, without everyone here, I wouldn't be where I am today. So uh, thank you, first and foremost, to everybody. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about not getting caught. 
So before we dive into how I personally would think about how I'm not going to get caught, let's look at some guys who did a bad job at not getting caught. <laughs> so Jeremy Hammond, he's the, uh, the guy that hacked uh, Stratfor. And so the thing with, with his hack, he, or his, his problem was that he trusted humans. So he actually ended up getting ratted out by the former anonymous member, Sabu. Um, and uh, he, they, you know, the FBI busted down his door, flash grenades, everything with, you know, assault rifles. And what did he do? He immediately just closed his laptop, encrypting it forever. So, you know, the FBI at the point, they're like, oh, well, we're never getting into that, right? Does anyone know how they did end up actually getting into the laptop? He didn't give them the, his password. He chose a really shitty password. <laughs> he, his password was his cat's name, one, two, three. <laughs> so, you know, you go through this whole process, like, I'm going to encrypt my laptop, I'm going to hide from the FBI, and he chose a really crappy password. So, you know, as, as somebody who's going to look at not getting caught, I mean, I'm, you still got to defend yourself, too. Um, you got some of the lulzsec hackers. You know, as you start adding more members to your hacking group, it, it creates more problems, right? Like you have more communications, you have to like worry about talking to them and not getting caught that way. So, you know, that's that's another another case. Like trusting humans is not something I'm going to do. Um, and then you got Ross Ulbrich, Dread Pirate Roberts. This is the mastermind behind the Silk Road. So uh, we're going to talk about Ross Ulbrich in particular here. So Dread Pirate Roberts, because he did a lot of things really wrong um, when it comes to OPSEC. I'm going to list out a few things here. Bear with me. Boasted about creating an economic simulation on LinkedIn. So he basically went to LinkedIn and said, hey, on, on his own personal account, he said, I'm going to create this awesome website where I'm going to just completely subvert the government. So that's one problem, right? One thing. So he, he purchased virtual private servers using his real picture on a fake ID. So he... He could have put anybody's picture there. He put his real picture on a fake ID. That got caught. And, and you know, it's like, hey, who's this guy? The nine fake IDs. Um, he, he went to Stack Overflow and asked for advice on how to code Silk Road. <laughs> so, like, he would post a question like, how do I connect to a, a Tor hidden service using curl and PHP? You know, with his, with his real email address. Not, he didn't try to obfuscate that at all. Um, he actually tried to hire an undercover cop to kill somebody. You know, trusting humans again. I mean, if you're going to hire somebody to kill somebody, I mean, maybe don't, I don't know, trust some random person you met. I don't know. Um, and then he actually had a real technological security flaw uh, with, 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 uh, with Silk Road. He actually had a vulnerability where his, the public IP address was actually being leaked. So if you know anything about Tor Hidden Services, you know, you can only connect through it through the Tor network. And that actual public system should be, should be hidden uh, through that process. But he actually had a vulnerability where his actual public IP was being leaked. So the FBI saw that one day. They're like, oh, hey, let's go compromise that server. Or confisc confiscate it. Um, and then, oh, he accessed the Silk Road from a block from his house. So, like, you know, if you're going to go run a billion dollar drug industry, why do it right down the road from your house? All right, so how am I going to go about this? I'm going to design it with OPSEC first and foremost in my mind. How am I going to go about setting up an inf infrastructure to attack organizations without getting caught? So let's try to avoid his mistakes. We're not going to trust any humans. I'm going to do it all by myself. Uh, I'm going to build an, an attack infrastructure with OPSEC being the first and foremost. So how I'm going to go about actually doing the exploitation phase is all going to be very, very much OPSEC driven. And then maintaining an anonymity in both the real and digital worlds. And the reason I say the real world, too, because... Let's say I want to go buy some Bitcoin for cash. Um, you know, I, I don't want that person that I'm buying Bitcoin from in cash to really figure out who I really am. So even in the, the real world, I still have to remain somewhat anonymous. So let's talk about the actual setup. This is the real, this is my infrastructure and how I'm going to go about attacking organizations and not getting caught. So here's just some, some necessities, right? Some things that are absolute musts. We're going to have to have a laptop to work from, maybe some internet. You know, that'd that help. Uh, VPNs, maybe some proxies to route through, um, some command and control servers, attack servers, um, and then non-attributable currency, you know, go buy some, some gift cards or Bitcoin. Um, these are just the necessities. So find a laptop's easy. Go to Craigslist, find, you know, there's a ton of different laptops, so you can go buy those in cash, right? That's the easy part. That's kind of straightforward. Um, internet, same thing. Like, we're going we're gonna to access it from a free Wi-Fi spot somewhere, right? Like, that's the, the, the typical mindset. 
Uh, my favorite thing is to do like apartment complexes because then you get really good internet sometimes. You know, they might have like some 100 meg download. Um, you know, you get a Starbucks, you get kind of crappy internet. Um, yeah, here's, here's a really key point. So in my mind, if I were to be a malicious attacker, I'm not going to access my, my attack infrastructure from half a block from my house like Ross Ulbricht did. I'm going to go greater than 50 miles. Um, and the other key thing is I'm not ever going to bring my residence into the circumference of my house. So <laughs> funny story. There was actually a hacker that was caught because he was accessing his, his attack infrastructure from 10 miles east of his house, 10 miles north, 10 miles west, various Starbucks. And the cops were like, hey, huh, he literally made a circle right around where he lives. <laughs> so you know, it was, it was easy for them to go, go find him. So, you know, when we go to, like, this place that we're going to work, you know, we're not going to show up and, like, have, like, some, like, sock thing thinking we're, you know, being, like, OPSEC friendly because we've got this weird sweater thing that's covering our laptop. So let's talk about a bit more OPSEC safe, you know? Maybe we'll get, like, some power to, like, sit out in our car, right? Like, get a nice little power converter, get a Yagi antenna, and then, you know, have an alpha card, and then you can access it from, you know, a good, good distance away, and then you end up looking like this, like a true hacker. Like, dude. <laughs> Black hat beanie and all. Because, you know, you can't hack without either a black hat beanie or a, a, a black hoodie, right? I mean, it's just not, it doesn't work that way. All right, so the actual attack architecture. How am I going to do this? Um, I'm never going to attack a, a, an organization directly, meaning I'm never going to send packets from where I'm sitting to that organization. Um, we're going to use multiple different uh, VPS networks to route the traffic through. And in order to be non-attributable, we're going to need some alternate identities and some Bitcoin because buying the VPS servers themselves is going to take some, some sort of non-attribution in, in its own. Um, so buying Bitcoin for cash is, is easy. You can go find people that sell it around here uh, very easily. And then you can actually buy VPSs for Bitcoin, which is really cool, right? Because then you buy, it for ca buy Bitcoin for cash, remain anonymous buying the Bitcoin, buy a VPS under an alternate identity using Bitcoin, then there's really not a whole lot to kind of trace back to you at that point from, from the, the perspective of obtaining your virtual private servers. All right, so the primary attack system. This is, this is the main network setup, right? So I've got, I'm going to have two different virtual private server networks. I'm going to have VPS network one, which is going to have a VPN server, a management server, and possibly password cracker, because I'm not going to bring any of my my files that I'm, I'm running uh, or, or that I'm taking from an organization back to my local laptop. I'm going to strictly keep all that stuff off of the local laptop just for OPSEC purposes. So if I need to crack some passwords, we'll do it out in the VPS. And then I'm going to have VPS Network 2, where I'm actually going to have the primary attack server and uh, a command and control server. So connectivity-wise, VPN into virtual private server network 1. And bear with me, because i got a nice diagram of all this in a minute. Um, I'm going to SSH and RDP or you know, VNC to my management server inside of VPS network 1. So I'm not, I'm not just you know, VNCing straight up to the virtual private server network 1 because you know, there's, you know, having a VPN there kind of limits the, the, the availability of somebody on the local network from sniffing the traffic and whatnot. So VPN, then connecting to the management server. The management server is really there to, uh, to, to route my connections to the actual attack infrastructure, which we'll talk about in a minute. I'm going to route all of the traffic from the management server through Tor. All of that through Tor, SSH over from the management server to my virtual private server network 2, where I've got my attack infrastructure. And it looks something like this. So <laughs> I've got, let's walk through this. I've got, I've got my laptop that I bought with cash. I've live booted it with a Linux history. I've connected to a free Wi-Fi coffee shop somewhere. I'm VPN from that, that Wi-Fi out to my virtual private server network 1, where I've got a VPN server. I'm SSH, or maybe even like VNC or RDP to the management server. And from there, we're routing all of that traffic through the Tor proxy nodes, which uh, you know, you're going to hit like at least three proxies there. And then the SSH traffic from that point is all going through Tor into the actual attack infrastructure. So the target organization should only ever see two IPs, really, that are attacking it. They should only ever see anything that's in VPS network 2. And uh, the, the reason that I kind of set this up this way with, with Tor in the middle, some people were like, well, why don't you just, why don't you just connect straight through Tor? Why, don't you, why do you bypass this, this whole thing and just connect through Tor out to VPS Network 2? Well, there have been a number of demonstrated attacks against Tor itself uh, where, you know, you can, if, you, if you control the, the, the um, entry and exit nodes, you can kind of correlate where that traffic came from. Uh, so in this infrastructure setup, I've got it in between two different VPS networks, which kind of, 
you know, if, if somebody were to control that traffic or, or know where the traffic's coming from, they're going to be just led back to my VPS network one, which still kind of, you know, is, is kind of a, a trail to go down at that point. You know, they're going to have to go to VPS network one and then try to figure out where I connected from from there and eventually find out that it was from like a, you know, a Starbucks somewhere. Um, remember, this, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to keep OPSEC in mind. Um, so something interesting that I, I'm actually not entirely sure uh, because I don't have control of, of, of a VPS network myself, but one thing that I was, I was kind of tossing around the idea of, so like let's say somebody traced it back to Tor, let's say for some reason they were able to trace the Tor network back to my VPS network one here. So a lot of, a lot of cloud services offer uh, VPS hosts and they'll give you like a public LAN IP on that VPS. So like for example, Amazon will do that. Amazon EC2. So if I connect over the public IP, or not public, private IP, private RFC 1918 IP, from my VNC server to the management server, is anything actually logging that? You know, so that's like, once you hit the management server, you're going to see, you know, trace back to the public IP of the management server, but from there, is anything actually really logging that traffic inside of VPS Network 1? So who knows, the trail might die there, and eventually, like, if somebody did trace it back to the, the Wi-Fi hotspot, I will be at a different one by that time. So, anyways, so I know a lot of you are thinking, like, damn, like, the latency on this must be crazy. Well, I actually set it up, and it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, I live booted off of a Linux di distro. I uh, connected to free Starbucks Wi-Fi. I vpn to a VPS server uh, that I set up, which is literally just a VPN server and uh, one of the cloud-based services. I then VNC'd, this, the main, main window you see here is me VNCing to my management server, just a new Ubuntu box, um, where I routed all the traffic through Tor. So you can see, you know, I've got like the congratulations, this browser's configured to Tor. So it's not just HTTP traffic that I'm routing through Tor though, it's all traffic. So as you can see in my SSH test, it's probably, you know, you probably can't see it from the back, but yeah, it's not coming through very well. But if I, I did like a netstat, and you can see the actual public exit node from Tor as the SSH IP address. So all of this, it is being routed through Tor. So I'm SSH to my attack server where I got, you know, Metasploit and uh, whatever else on that attack infrastructure. And, you know, even if the latency was bad, you could all do it all in screen sessions anyway. You know, and then if you lose connection, just connect back to the screen session. And of course, the mandatory caffeination. Got to have caffeine. Okay, so now we've got our attack set up, ready to go. We've got to figure out how we're going to go about targeting organizations. What is our motivation? Well, you could go after easy targets. That's, you know, easy, right? You could pick high profile targets, you know, things, companies that, that we just have like an itching to attack. Uh, then you've got contracted targets. You know, maybe one day, you know, I might get paid just for targeting a specific company. And then you've always got vengeance. You know, I don't like those guys, so I'm going to target them. So let's talk about easy targets first. So I spent about 15 minutes on Shodan which uh, is awesome if you haven't used Shodan before, go check it out. Um, and I just looked for unauthenticated VNC servers. So these are servers that are publicly available to the internet that have a VNC service running that does not require authentication. I spent about 15 minutes and here's some examples of what I found. Um, so we've got a wide open Windows server in Romania, I think. Um, we've got a wide open Windows server in Taiwan. Uh, we've got uh, an industrial control system in Greece that looks like it's like, I don't know, like. Hy hygiene or something, so maybe it's like some poop coming out there. I don't know what that is, but it looks fun. Um, another Windows server, just wide open. Like, remember, these are not, no authentication to these. They're just wide open on the internet. Uh, here's actually like a patient health record system in the US, just wide open. That's kind of scary. Um, and then, you know, a Mac for good measure, right? <clears throat> uh, vulnerable services. So instead of trying to just, you know, let me just run a Voln scan against an organization and try to find something that potentially might be exploitable. Let's just look for publicly available hosts that are already exploitable. So things like VSFTP 2.3.4, which has a publicly available exploit in Metasploit. 130 servers on the public internet that you can find with Shodan. Just go exploit them today. Or, you know, we could look for high profile targets, right? Like we can pick out the enterprises of the world. You know, we got the hos hospitals. You know, the, the, the fun organizations to go target because, you know, they might make us more when it comes to the profitization stage. And then you got contract targets. So this is actually a real Hitman network on the dark web. You can go literally buy a Hitman uh, for Bitcoin. So, I mean, eventually, maybe somebody wants to just contract targets out to me for, for hacking, right? I mean, why not? 
then you got Vengeance. You know, you got Mr. Robot, who you know just takes down Evil Corp. Um, you know, we could pick pick an organization just because we don't like them. So after we've picked our organization, decided we're going to attack them, let's do a good amount of recon into how we're going to go about exploiting them. We're not just going to throw you know hail mary you know DB auto pwn at them. Um, <clears throat> so information disclosure. Every Nessus scan you've ever ran into that has information disclosure, it's like a low finding, right? Well, let's talk about some of the more interesting ones. How about an organization's username structure that you can gain from publicly available systems? That's, that's kind of cool. Um, how about credentials and previous breaches? So things like Pwnless can show you. Pwnless will grab everything from, uh, from any breach that, that gets dumped publicly to the internet. Um, and then maybe just like, you know, we've got to know the external network ranges, maybe we look those up in Shodan, find, find some, some targets through that. Um, we're going to minimize the noise. We're going to use sites like Shodan and Census to once again look for the low-hanging fruit um, and find, you know, just open ports. We're going to locate external login portals, which uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, because external login portals, if you're using LDAP authentication, can be a lot of fun. <coughs> Let's talk about exploiting now. So we've, we've gained some information about an organization. We know it's publicly available. We know, hey, maybe this company has BSFTPD 2.3.4 and we can just go exploit it. Or, hey, maybe we were able to gain the username structure and we can do some other attacks with that. Um, so exploitation page. Let's talk about credential reuse. So traditionally, when, when organizations or, or employees or anyone thinks about credential reuse, people think like, oh, I'm using the same password on another account. Or, for example, like my, maybe my, I have like an administrative uh, user that has a separate like domain admin account. And like I, I found one recently where the guy just reused the same password on his administrator account and his domain admin account. So the account the guy's using for daily activity to open up every email, he's opening up like every PDF he gets sent and, you know, launching every Java applet, that, that account has the same password as his domain admin. So, um, but in this sense, what I'm talking about is not across the same enterprise account. I'm talking about the, uh, the actual personal accounts of employees. So this gets in kind of a gray area because this is something that, that an employee owns outside of the organization. So think of like, like a Gmail account or Yahoo or anywhere you can go publicly sign up for an account. <clears throat> so how can we exploit that? So I was doing a pen test recently where I found... Uh, where I submitted, I submitted the company's domains to PwnList. And PwnList will tell you, hey, here's the certain number of, uh, of, of email addresses of this domain that were compromised. So this particular company had you know, 157 for their main corporate one, 82 for another main corporate email address, and then 50,000 Pwned accounts for a domain that was technically their customers. So I imagine a company like, like a Google and they have Gmail, right? So if I were to submit every Gmail address, they might say, hey, you know, you have 10 million pwned accounts or whatever. Um, or like an ISP where you've got, like at Verizon's a good example. They got Verizon.net if you're a customer. Um, or at Verizon.net email addresses. So this company was kind of similar to that in the fact that they had, uh, they had their own domain for their customers. So this was their customer's domain. So I started thinking, all right, I've got 50,000 credentials of people who use this company. How can I go about finding out if any of those people are employees at the company and they reused their same password on their personal account. <clears throat> so the way I did this is I, I went to Pipple. Pipple's a, a great site for, for collaborating. They collaborate a ton of information from a lot of different social networks. LinkedIn uh, connects to like YouTube, uh, like pretty much anything that you can find on the internet. And we'll try to kind of collaborate all that information into a detailed kind of story about a person that it can find on the internet. So what I did is I submitted those 50,000 email addresses to Pipple, and I just grepped the results for the company name that I was targeting. So these are personal email addresses, and somebody said, hey, I work at this company. For example, this is manager, network operations support at X company, right? I got 252 hits from this. So I had 252 accounts that were personal email addresses, that said they worked at the target company I was trying to target. And I also had their credentials because they were part of a breach. So now it became, can I just convert those back to the, the organization's actual email structure? If I know their name, it's probably first name dot last name or first initial dot last name at company name dot com. We go try their credentials on their OWA portal and hey, now we've got a valid domain account just from credential reuse on a personal account. <clears throat> so 
that one, that's attack number one. I'm gonna talk about three different attacks. So here's, here's attack number two. Password spraying. Password spraying is probably my favorite thing. I love password spraying. Um, if you don't know what password spraying is, traditionally, when you think about password attacks, we think about brute forcing passwords, right? Like I'm gonna throw a million different words at somebody's account and try to guess their password. Password spraying is different as it will not actually lock out accounts. So when you, when you try to brute force accounts, you're gonna lock out accounts really quickly, especially if you have like a domain authentication um, and you know, you've got like your, your, your password uh, threshold of like five. So you, know, you hit five, five attempts and you lock out an account. Um, with password spraying, you kind of take the opposite approach. You take everybody's username in the environment. So everyone in the room, everyone has their own username. I'm gonna try one password against everybody's account. And I'm gonna pick a good one. I'm gonna pick something like winner2016 or password1. And I guarantee you, I will get a number of you in the room by using every single person's username. So uh, when we look at password spraying, we just try one, one attempt. So I know what you're thinking. Like, all right, so I'm an external attacker. How do I get the usernames? How do I, how do I know what to try at, at, you know, as an external attacker? Internally, you, know, you can just run uh, net users forward slash domain, get all the usernames from the domain, and then try it internally. That's a lot easier. Externally, though, you have to figure out how the, that username structure works. So there's a tool called FOCA. And FOCA uh, will go and grab all of the publicly available files from a domain. So all of the .doc files, all of the Excel files, all of the PDFs, um, and it will go and download all this. So it basically it's just doing Google searches, right? It's doing like, like site colon company name, file type .doc. And it will find all the .doc files and go download them. The interesting thing is that you can also extract all of the metadata from those files. So one thing that a lot of people don't do when they post things publicly is strip all the metadata. And if you create a doc file or PDF, a lot of times you have your username attached to that file. So all these publicly available files that we're able to pull, we're extracting usernames. And so I, I did this on a recent test and I, I figured out the username structure. Um, which, which, I mean, it was, it was a little bit of an easy username structure, right? I, I then took that username structure, crafted a list of every possible combination. So they basically had like a, like a three character, uh, uh, pre prepended, uh, uh, th three characters prepended to the username, so something like EMP. And then they had the initials of the user, so something like ABC. So it was a six character username. I cre created a list of all those usernames and I tried one password against every single one of them against an external portal. This particular company, I was doing an external assessment for and then was scheduled to do an internal assessment later on. Before I even got access to do the internal assessment, I had 252 valid cr domain credentials before I even touched the internal network. So, uh, you know, like this, this, is, this is an attack, you know, as an external attacker, getting domain creds, really the first step, you know, getting, getting access to a network. So let's talk about phishing. Phishing is you know, known as what we call the golden ticket to pretty much any network, right? <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about two different types of phishing. I'm gonna talk about credential gathering and system compromise. Credential gathering. So <clears throat> the first thing that I would try to do is set up an external portal that looks like something that users are already used to logging into. Um, something that looks like maybe an OWA portal that they're used to logging into every day. And hey, you know, we need you to sign in, we need you to sign into the OWA portal to you know, validate your new benefits for some reason, and people will do it, and they'll go try to log in, and then they'll get you know, a, a login failure because it doesn't work, but we immediately redirect them to the, uh, the actual login portal, so you know, they just think they just mistyped their password, and you know, nobody's the wiser, and they just, oh, okay, well, maybe I just mistyped that. Um, and then you know, remote exploitation, that's probably one of the more common ones we do. Um, sending Word document macros, right? Like that's the new, the new hotness, right? Like everybody's doing Word document macros. Every, every attacker is doing that. Um, because everyone wants to just enable content no matter how hard you know, they say not to. Um, <clears throat> everybody just sees that button, it's like I have to press it. You know? there's, no <laughs> there's no way I can't press that button. Um, so, all right, so kind of quick, quick funny story. Um, myself and uh, Joff Thayer, who works at our company as well, we were doing a phishing assessment for an organization. And <laughs> so we started doing some recon and we found that this company did uh, they did like a, a national like walk at work day. They're gonna do some exercise. And um, at, this or, at, this, at this like retreat thing, we saw that they had like a number of vendors there from a, a, a number of other companies, like, like clothing vendors and whatnot. So I was talking to Joff and I was like, hey, 
what if we just pretended to be one of these vendors and you know tried to send like a coupon and said, hey, thanks for coming out, you know, to our national walk at, at lunch day or whatever. Um, here's 50% off our our merchandise at our store. So <laughs> we created this coupon. Um, we sent it to all these employees. It was just like raining shells on us. Like everybody's <laughs> everybody's enabling content. And all right, so the bad part is, you know, we got shells. That's that's you know bad for the organization. But the worst part is. People were actually like printing it out and leaving work to go like actually try to get the 50% off. <laughs> so, you know, we caught some flack for that, but whatever. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've, we've gained access to credentials, maybe fish to user. Now it becomes, how am I going to access that network remotely? So one of my key, one of my key like beliefs in doing this is I'm not going to do any physical attacks because I don't want to get caught. I, I, I think, you know, there's plenty of people who do physical pen tests very well, and there's plenty of ways to get into organizations physically, but I just feel like I don't need the risk. Like, I can just move on to another organization if I can't get in remotely. So, number one, is, is two-factor in play on a VPN, like an external VPN? If I got creds for a user, can I just literally just VPN to the network without having to have two-factor? Is there just like externally facing RDP servers that I can just go log into? How about access to OAP? So, all right, that's not access to the network per se, but hey, Phishing across internal accounts is gold. Like, I find an, like a, a conversation between somebody that's already like in a heated debate about one thing, and then say, "Hey, you know what? Screw you! I'm gonna click this link right here." And they're like, "Hey, I know this guy. They've already been in a conversation with me. I'm gonna listen to them and I'm gonna click that link." <laughs> and like I said, no, no physical attacks. So post exploitation. So after we've gained access to a network. See, the, the thing is with, this, with this, uh, this entire talk is, for me, we, we get basically given access, right? Most of the pen tests we do, they say, hey, here's a non-administrative non account on a normal Windows build or whatever is normal to the environment. Go, right? So <clears throat> for me, post-exploitation, this is something I do every day, and it's, it's easy. And this particular slide, I'm going to try to boil down my entire B-Sides Tampa talk from last year into this one side, so let's go. <clears throat> so PowerShell. We never have to ever actually use external tools anymore on pen tests. It's all, all, all we need are PowerShell and command line. Group policy preferences. We still find on almost, I don't know, 90% of organizations, we find a clear text administrative credential through group policy password files. Um, if you don't know what those are, Basically, organizations previously could set up uh, like a local administrative user via GPO, and the second you would connect to the device to the domain, it would go get the GPO, install the new local admin. The problem with that is uh, those the, the the password and the username are available to the domain, so that you know new systems can access it, create that new local admin. The problem is that the uh, the credential is using uh, an encryption key that is widely known, so it's easy to go decrypt it. <coughs> so. You know, that's, that's one way that we get admin on a network very quickly. Widespread local admin. So whenever you're not randomizing the passwords across your systems in your environment, it makes it easy for us to go pivot around using the same, same credential, the local admin. Finding insecure permissions on other systems. So something we find kind of common is they'll, like, like an administrator will, for some reason, put domain users group in the local admins group on a system, which means Everybody in the domain is an admin of that system now, and those are easy to find. Like you think, like, oh, hey, like, yeah, it's just one system in 10,000. No, it's easy to find those with with uh, a PowerShell tool called PowerView. Uh, there's a script, find local admin access, and it will go to every system and say, hey, my local admin on you. Hey, my local admin on you. Hey, my local admin on you. And if he finds domain users and local admins, hey, I'm local admin on that system now. I can go pivot to it, and I can go obtain the the, at least the hash of the local admin user from that system. And if you're using widespread admin account, then I can just pivot around using the hash. <clears throat> internal password spraying. So we talked about external password spraying a bit ago, but internal password spraying is money as well. Not, there's not a whole lot of organizations that we've tested that have detected it. You know, we're trying one, one attempt against every account. And uh, a lot of times they're not, they're not detecting that stuff, you know. And then, you know, we play the, the, the PS exec Mimi Cats combo, we're hopping around with boxes. So, you know, we get, get one local admin cred, pivot to that system, run Mimi Cats. Maybe, maybe get another uh, uh, user's credential um, that we can use to gain access to another system. A lot of times we use a tool called User Hunter, which helps us find 
uh, where specific users of groups are logged into certain systems on the network. So for example, domain admins. Uh, we, with, with User Hunter, you can say, hey, every system on the network, do you have a domain admin logged into you? And if I have a local admin credential, I just pivot to that system, run Mimikatz, and dump that domain admin's clear text credential from memory. So then it becomes, you know, looting, right? Like I've compromised an organization, got DA. Our favorite thing to do is pivot to the DC and dump all the hashes um, because it's just fun to crack everybody's password in a domain. My, my new favorite thing is to find vCenter servers or any sort of virtualization engine and and show like a screenshot of me logged into vCenter as a domain admin and say, hey, look at all these awesome servers I have access to. And all right, so the best thing about vCenter is when you get a really good sysadmin, because they organize the crap out of it, right? Like they've got, here's my SQL servers, here's my, my exchange environment, here's all the, the web servers, here's my DMZ. Um, you know, it's, it's beautiful, right? Because then, you know, as an attacker, you know, I don't have to like work that hard to figure out what everything is anymore. It's just handed out to me. <clears throat> The other thing with, with vCenter, too, is a lot of people or a lot of organizations think, you know, I've got this awesome, you know, PCI environment that you can only get to through, uh, you know, through, um, uh, through a, jump, a jump system on RDP from a certain IP at, like, 5 p.m. on a Thursday. And you go log into vCenter, and it's like, oh, hey, I can just console right to that. <laughs> so completely bypassing all the firewall rules that you might think are there. All right, so... Now we get to the profitization stage. We've taken over a company. We've got access to vCenter. We've dumped all the, the creds from, from a domain. How do we go about turning it into actual hard cash, right, like as an attacker? This is something that uh, I, I thought a pretty great deal about. And um, yeah, well, let's just go through it. So turning compromise to cash. Here, here's some things that we could possibly do. We could be a carver, right? Like we could go install point of sale malware on all the card systems in the environment and try to do kind of like the target ha hack, right? Like try to just exfiltrate card numbers, scrape them all from memory on the system. We could try to do just identity thefts. You know, if we find that we just want to attack hospitals or any, any organization that has some sort of, you know, PHI or PII, go steal all that, become an identity theft, right? Ransomware. <clears throat> this seems to be the new hotness, right? Like everybody's, everybody's doing ransomware these days and, you know, they're making probably a good bit of money of it. I mean, it's in the news every day now. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, you could be a hacktivist too. You could just go screw with companies. Why not? So I, I saw this news article the other day, or I guess it's like last month now, um, about how Apple employees were being offered like 23 grand just for their credential, just for their credential to log into the Apple network. So to me, I'm thinking like, okay, I could go set up this crazy Carter infrastructure and like have to have like all this, you know, other technologically um, uh, installed tools and um, ha I'd have to have like probably a command and control server that stays up all the time to have like, you know, the, the hitbacks from, from the Carter network. But what if I just go sell the creds that I get from hacking a company to the Carters themselves? You know, if they're paying upwards of 23 grand, why not just go do that? Why not just let me do what I do every week, compromise an organization, get domain creds. You know, this, this is just like basic creds, right? Like they're just offering like middle management, 23 grand for their creds. But hey, what if I went to these same people and said, hey, I got a domain admin at this company. You know, you would assume maybe like 50, 100 grand for each one of those. So here's the tricky part. Yes, I put a Bruce Schneier quote in my, my talk. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to read it to you because I think it fits perfectly. It's not that we find criminals like this through cyber forensics. We get them in the real world when they do something stupid. It's invariably how it works. Getting credit cards is easy. Turning it into cash is hard. So I got to this point, and it really is hard. Like, I, I really thought about it a lot. I mean, obviously, the guys that are doing ransomware and they're, you know, these other, other attackers that are accepting Bitcoin as payment uh, are figuring out a way to get it out. So Bitcoin is probably the obvious choice, right, like, to go with initially. But there's two major problems. Bitcoin is not untraceable. And turning a large amount of Bitcoin into cash is really hard. Like, if I, if I take 100 grand of Bitcoin and try to sell that to somebody, that's going to cause, cause kind of a blip, right? So here's some things to look at for Bitcoin. You can go to uh, blockchain.info and look at all the transactions that have ever happened on the blockchain. It's the, the ledger of all the transactions. Um, and then there's a site called Bloxier that will let you kind of trace it back a little easier, too, kind of visually. Um, so, for example, this... This one transaction was $3.4 million in Bitcoin. Somebody, or, I, you know, I traced it back to a mixer service, which, you know, that, that seems like the obvious choice, right? Like, go, go mix the Bitcoins, and hopefully, you know, that'll kind of kill the trail. But there's still risk there, you know. Eventually, 
it becomes money laundering. And I, I didn't travel down that road. I didn't, I didn't want to go down that path of, of, you know, walking you guys through, hey, this is how I go money, you know, launder a bunch of money. <laughs> so um, so my, my attack trail kind of stops here. So if you want to do the research, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after, after we get through this whole process, full rip and replace of everything, buy a new laptop, you know, get all the new VPS servers, and then start over again next week. Because to be honest, so from the time it took me to set up that, that virtual private server network that I showed you, that was like three, four hours to set that up. And when we get access to a, an organization, it's less than a day before we're getting domain admin in most cases. So this, this entire operation happens in a week. And then we're done with it. Scrap all that, go to different hotspots, get out of there. Um, rebuild from scratch. So let's fade back a little bit. Let's come back to, to the white hat a little bit. Um, why don't I do this? Well, first and foremost, ethics. I, I just personally want to be more of a, a help to the security community. I don't want, I don't want to be a detriment. Um, I want to create a better, a better world for my kids, really. Um, I, I, I don't want to screw over companies. I want to help companies. And then there's the inevitability of getting caught. Like, you always have that thought in the back of your mind, like, hey, you know, I mean, I, I guarantee most of you in the room probably picked out a bunch of holes in my entire attack story today. I bet a lot of you were thinking, like, how could I catch this guy? Oh, yeah, I would have caught him right there. And so I'm probably missing something anyway, right? So, you know, there's always that inevit inevitability of getting caught. And then there's the danger of entering the criminal world, right? Like, in order for me to go sell the Bitcoin, I'm going to have to go meet some drug dealers or something and, like, go s try to, like, do some, like, shady deals. And, yeah, that is not for me. <laughs> But we can make it better. Everybody, everybody that has any sort of touch in this security community, which most of you raise your hands, we can all do this. So I'm going to leave you with two things. I'm going to talk about defenders first. We need to shift our focus from attribution to detection and prevention. So I was, I was walking through this, this talk with one of my buddies uh, who's a, a security engineer at a company. And he, he basically pointed out, he said, so, all right, if I had, if I had two-factor on my external portals, or if I had, if I had more logging to... Uh, detect you when you're doing password spraying, um, you would have probably stopped there, right? Because, you know, like I said, I'm not going to do, if, if I can't access the network remotely, if I can't do phishing attacks, if I can't password spray, if I can't uh, just log into an old portal remotely, I'd probably, probably stop there, right? I mean, short of having publicly available exploits for certain services, because that's, you know, that's, that's another option, right? <clears throat> and then, obviously, increase the length of password policy. Got to throw that in there, right? Because everybody, everybody has that battle. Everybody's still on that eight character default policy, which enables us to password spray very easily. So uh, attackers, I'm going to say this. <clears throat> Continue to highlight the importance and value of credentials. Through this entire talk, there's three main things from a credential perspective, right? We, we you attempted to obtain credentials through password spraying, through uh, credential reuse. We then attempted to escalate our privileges to get higher level credentials, then we tried to sell the credentials at the end. So credentials, credentials are really worth a lot. A lot of people focus on, on um, you know, like, let me get the latest, like, SIM solution, or um, let me get, you know, some application whitelisting solution, but really, your users are still using crappy passwords. That's what we're going to use. We're just going to password spray and find those users and pivot around using their password. So attempt to locate credential reuse, um, attempt the password spraying stuff that I talked about, which both of these things, I actually wrote up in blog posts or on the Black Hills blog if you want to go check that out. Um, and then uh, escalate internally and crack all the passwords. So with that, I want to say have a great B-Sides. Thank you so much for having me here. I'll be... Thanks. If you want a free hack naked shirt, come to the booth.